The next session is on legality, compliance, and fundraising for NGOs. It will go on for about an hour and a half. And once again, we'll end with the speakers taking your questions. Rajesh Bhattacharjee will be speaking to us about fundraising. Rajesh is the CEO at RootBridge, an organization that partners with nonprofits to provide affordable, quality driven, and sustainable retail fundraising solutions. Rajesh has over two decades of experience in nonprofit fundraising having worked with top charities, including Azeem Premji Philanthropic Initiatives, Amnesty International, CARE, and Room to Read. Thereafter, Norshir will once again speak to us about regulatory, procedural, and legal requirements of which NGOs should be aware. As I mentioned before, Norshir Dajawala is um, uh, the Program Director, Legal and CSR Compliance at Center for Advancement and Philanthropy, or CAP. He's one of the sector's foremost consultants on CSR and legal compliance for nonprofits. Once again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box addressed to everyone while the session is ongoing. You can specify who the question will be addressed to, and you can also specify if you'd like the question answered in Hindi. We will be sharing a comprehensive guide covering the topics that come up today in both English and Hindi, as well as a recording of this seminar with all of you. If you'd like to reach out to others who have attended this event, um, please send a brief bio about yourself or your NGO to communications at iprobono.com by Friday the 13th of August. Please try to keep it to about 100 to 150 words. Uh, we'll circulate these bios to all those who registered for this event in the hopes of encouraging partnerships and collaboration between our participants today. Lastly, um, I would request everyone to please keep their videos and audios off for the duration of the session. With that, I'd like to ask Rajesh to take over. Thank you, Rajesh. Thanks. Thanks, Diksha. Thanks, uh, Noshir. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just straight go to the subject, Diksha. And with your permission, so I would uh, uh, very welcome to all of you again. Uh, Given the context, I thought that we probably could speak about two issues at a conceptual level. And then uh, like uh, Noshir also told you that these are at times very subjective and these are unique decisions that every organization will have to take based on their individual context. So even with fundraising and legalities around fundraising, this is very similar. So being uh, such a diverse country, uh, all of you will have to conceptually understand these challenges and their context very well, and then take your personal decisions. So this uh, is not prescriptive. My, I have also not attempted to kind of be suggestive in whatever I am going to uh, speak about here, rather, I will open up, you know, various types of windows for you to kind of imagine, explore yourself. So the first topic I will talk about is building resilience in, is about building resilience in civil, civil society or the rising complexities around funding of civil society organizations. And we would try to find out the reasons about these complexities, why these complexities uh, exist now, what are their origins, which probably would help you to seek answer while you try to address some of these complexities to secure funding for your organization. The other topic that I will talk about is specifically about funding the civil society organization and the aspect of purpose-driven fundraising. It's very, very short. I, will, I don't think I will spend more than 15 minutes uh, in these slides and uh, uh, I would hope that probably we can have more of an interactive kind of a uh, discussion here. So, Noshir also spoke about the, you know, he spoke, although with a legal eye, with a legal prism, around the different kind of structural existence of, uh, you know, various types of community-based organizations, service delivery organizations, NGOs, etc. So he spoke about all of it with a legal eye. Me being a fundraiser, I think my perspective will be more from liberal arts and it's a very specialized fundraising eye. So if you look at all the civil society organizations around the world and including in India, they exist in these four structures. 
even if they are community based organizations even if you know it's a uh, very small entity in a remote uh, area even if it's a very small movement in a very very remote area of the country they all will have to exist probably in these four characters one is ngo which is very common most of most of you will be aware of they are very formal in nature diksha will also mute my video is that okay we can hear you thank you okay if there is any problem please let me know i'll do that so ngo is more formal and uh, you all would be aware of it the other is social movement the best example of social movement in indian context will be trade unions uh the uh, third one is network network is more about you know a group of like minded entities joining to together around technology etc and uh, picking up a single issue which uh, influences a community or even nations at times a very good example is the fair trade movement so it was all the fair trade regulations laws which governs international business and laws and relationships now actually emerged out of a lot of networking work done by the civil society organizations around the world the other example was also the banning of landmines or the or the arms trade treaty so these are very very big global examples of how networks in civil societies actually created very big impact in terms of international relations and business the fourth and the last one technically they are called plateaus plate you must be aware of world economic forum which is held at davos but many people will not know that there is something called world social forum which also exists in france and it's many many years older than world economic forum so but the difference between these ngo social movements networks and plateau are that plateau are more event specific event specific and they are centered around specific events so there is a lack of continuity with plateaus so i wanted to give you this context because this context the structural context of civil society and to understand who you are structurally is extremely crucial in determining many legal aspects of fundraising and also while you make fundraising choices the second thing i wanted to touch upon is that one is the structural aspect but when you get into fundraising you are actually communicating with the rest of the world with different types of stakeholders you are no longer communicating with yourself with within but you are also going to communicate with people who would not know you like the way you know yourself so the world perceives civil society with different prisms as well for example you might be an ngo you might be a network you might be a plateau but you might and or you might be a social movement but the world will perceive you and it is constantly perceiving you and reading you with different eye so what i have attempted here is that i have attempted to write or interpret you know what are these different prisms what are the what are these different eyes through which the world look at civil society so the first and the foremost one which is quite predominant is a liberal eye and the liberal eye emerges from the idea that civil society exists because of exclusion so Uh, and also after globalization the peta different patterns of globalization actually started to challenge the exclusivity of the state and these issue of exclusion the downtrodden the you know unheard etc this is rooted to the existence and emergence of civil society so that's an i that's it so this is not about right or wrong i am just giving you an objective analysis of different pers perspective that the world has about civil society and to be aware of that that what is that perception that is that the world has about you is also very important while you make fundraising choices 
So the second view is a realist view, where uh, there is a section of, you know, people. Uh, so generally the civil society is a sphere, it is believed as a sphere, which exists beyond government, market, or family. So these are, if you imagine these three as institutions, but civil society actually exists beyond the government, beyond the market, and beyond family. So it's a fourth dimension altogether. And hence, the realists believe that this is kind of a tool. So civil society is a kind of a tool whereby the powerful states advance their different types of agendas, you know, for promoting different types of issues and ideas. Sometimes they are key to national interest. But if you take the contemporary local view, and not only local, if you look at Turkey, if you look at China, if you look at Hungary, uh, if you, even if you look at America during the Trump, time of Trump, uh, unfortunately, many European countries are also becoming like that. So these popularizing ideas that are key to national interest, that has also been challenged now. So they are saying there is a view now that they are not necessarily you know, furthering ideas that are always key to the national interest. So that is another view which has come up now. So the third one is the Marxist prism, where they believe that the civil society exists as political vanguards, you know, sometimes even as political vigilantes or social vigilantes. So, so the, this is a more kind of a uh, extremist view when I say extremist, I do not mean in, uh, you know, uh, very extremist term. I mean it literally in, uh, in, in, in the social sphere. So, for example, I will wait for her to come. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, for example, many social movements, I gave you the example of trade unions as uh, one as uh, so civil society, uh, which exists as social movements. So many trade unions also actually start to believe that uh, they are beyond the, you know, constitutional boundaries, boundaries. So they start to imagine even beyond the state or the nation, etc. So that's an extremist view as well. So beyond these three uh, eyes that or perspective or interpretation of civil society, there is a fourth view also, whereby in this, which has grown in the Southern hemisphere in the last decade. Uh, so some people even argue that the concept of civil society as a sphere distinct from family, state or government is a Western concept that does not apply easily to a country like India or societies in the Southern Hemisphere and primarily in the all the emerging economies where the boundaries between these spheres are much more blurred. So that is another view that exists. So these views are extremely crucial to be aware of uh, while you, you know, take different kind of fundraising decisions. The last aspect which I wanted to uh, touch upon around this area is the uh, finance issue. So when you go about thinking about fundraising about your organization, it is extre it is an existential question. So it is sometime or most often I would say uh, it is misunderstood as a financial question alone. So when a civil society organization, if you are an NGO or whosoever you are, if you are a social movement or a network, so whenever you are you start about, you know, exploring the questions of funding possibilities. Who is going to fund my work? How am I going to raise money for my work? Most often we end up looking at these questions with a financial prism. And that's where organization falter. So they fail to look at that question beyond, the, beyond meeting the financial need. But if you can link your fundraising work with your core purpose, you know, then it becomes much more existential. The question can become much more difficult to answer. So if you, for example, if you are an NGO and if you just uh, look at your fundraising problems with a financial eye, then you will definitely look at the market available 
and see how much money is available and where they are. And most often you will see that if you are an industrial nation or a very developed economy or even an emerging economy, we will end up looking at corporate and institutions or high net worth. But there are many other channels which are available, which can actually be more true to your purpose. So if you look at those questions only financially, then you will become market driven, possibly not that purpose driven. So the question of financing your work as a civil society movement becomes much more existential. And when you start looking at it, they become much more sensitive as well. So you become much more thoughtful in terms of uh, what kind of fundraising you should uh, pursue. So because also behind the financial question lay a number of fundamental questions relating to, relating to the you know relationships between the social movement and money and how this relationship is also complicated by the fact that movements active in the global justice movements you know uh, often combat international financial uh, institutions and even private corporations so if uh, you are a social movement uh, which was working on fair trade global taxation or debt relief or regulations of financial tra transactions around the world then you will find it extremely difficult to take money from many corporations uh, or even government uh, so all these big financial crises that happen around the world take the case of the crash of Lehman brothers which is very recent uh, uh, we, not recent, but you may call it a contemporary one. So a lot of regulations actually came in force after this kind of financial crisis happened. So obviously something wrong happened. You know, some states or some individuals or some corporations did some wrong. And then nations realized that there has to be some kind of regulations within and globally as well uh, to control these uh, transactions. So, and uh, so if you are doing this type of work, then it might be become extremely difficult for you to take money from many entities, many corporates, particularly corporate corporates, which are into financial uh, business, uh, purely because of conflict of interest. The other uh, thing which I have noticed as a fundraiser is that uh, in the civil society, uh, there are, there is, there is a, you know, uh, uh, section of uh, people uh, again i am not saying right on right or wrong i am not taking a position i am being very objective and fact based here so money is not never looked upon as something good it can't be so it's principle it's a principle philosophical position that they take that uh, i have seen that many civil society actors uh, identify themselves in a shared rejection of all that has to do with money or finance uh, the other complexity is that, uh, which is also related to the previous point I spoke about, that uh, many foundations, you know, she also spoke about foundations, many foundations or philanthropies, which uh, actually distributes uh, a lot of money, billions of dollars around the world today as grants to charities. So if you go to their origin, the origin of this money, then you will be left with many difficult questions to answer for yourself. So should you be taking those money? So for example, one of the foremost global funding organization in the world, uh, so it's a family and uh, they all, the family made all their money from mining. And it was in the 19th century in, uh, uh, in one country in the Western Hemisphere. And it, the history says that uh, for land acquisition, thousands of people were even shot to death, death uh, uh, for uh, mining purpose and all that. So if you go uh, deep into these, then you will be left with many difficult questions to answer. If you, if you try to trace the root of those money which are being given, given, as, given as grant for humanitarian work now. The other, the biggest challenge that the civil society face now that it is also passing through, like I said, that the patterns of globalization has uh, played a big role in the reemergence of civil society in a new form. And uh, what we are seeing is uh, the uh, more progressive democracies, 
and not definitely not in India, more progressive de democracies are also into a very deeper inquiry of, uh, you know, the benefits of opinion, opinion based democracy over representative democracy. So in representative democracy, if you vote, there is someone in power and that's like uh, being a monarch, you can do anything. But with opinion based democracy, voting is not everything. I mean, dialogue and uh, inclusion is more about, uh, you know, it refines the democracy further. So these kind of tensions, uh, these kind of opinions that civil society has, you know, emerged with now, lately over the last uh, two decades, this has created also a big amount of tension between the state, uh, the corporations, the, the state, the market, even the family and the civil society. So all of these changes that are happening in the civil society are also resulting in big shifts in the way funds are being distributed. Uh, so you now see restricted fund, unrestricted fund, you know, the, all the UN agencies has kept administrative funding as uh, to probably 7% now. Uh, all these public sector unit uh, in India has similar, uh, you know, things in place. So they are pretty stringent. So Noshir also spoke about, you know, the laws that exist in India. What can, what, who can be defined as, uh, 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 you know, what can be defined as a charitable organization. For example, I remember two words, poverty and distress. So if you are working for poverty and people in distress, then you are a charity. The irony is that when we shifted from millennium development goal to sustainable development goal, we actually shifted from poverty to injustice. Uh, so the UN accepted that Millennium Development Goal will not work. So it, if you have to actually remove poverty, you have to address the issue of uh, injustice. You have to issue the uh, issue of climate, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, sustainability, and all that. So that's why global, very very big global development organizations, they have shifted. So if you look at the history of civil society, it started with service, then it went to charity, then it went to welfare oriented development. And now it's all about right based development. So there's the shift from poverty to injustice. So they are addressing more deep rooted issues to bring in irreversible societal change. And these kind of shifts in the civil society and uh, the outlook towards the ad addressing the you know problems uh, so the civil society has been, has leapfrogged probably 50 years ahead in comparison to our legislature. That's the problem. So the law still says that uh, charitable organization is that which works for poverty and distress, but the global development sector has accepted the fact that you have to actually address injustice to address uh, poverty and you have to gradually also look towards right-based development. Uh, so that's the, you know, the gap and difficulties that exist uh, that has actually uh, accentuated the challenges of funding with the civil society movement. In this context, uh, I will now step into how are, I will talk about the top 15 global charities of the world, uh, which are extensively into fundraising. So they raise a lot of money, the maximum amount of money uh, for doing their charitable work. So how are they doing? So, and when I say largest world charities, I don't necessarily mean the quality of the work or the importance of the work that they do. Uh, the single parameter that I have taken here is the amount of revenue that they generate. So if you look at this table, uh, these are the top ones The Gavi uh, after the pandemic. So this is before the pandemic. So after the pandemic, I think Gavi has gone close to 10 billion US dollar. Uh, so, and I'm not aware of what percentage of Gavi's funds come, come from what sources. Uh, I'm, I was also not sure about the top three. So I didn't give you the split, but I have great details about the rest of the organization who I know very closely also. So you will see there is a pattern here 
that a lot of their uh, revenue actually comes from retail. And retail means huge volume, not big donations, but big, huge number of people giving small donations. It might be digitally, it might be offline, it might be through many channels, but it does not necessarily mean that they are funded by very, very rich people, rich foundations or rich corporates predominantly. The largest organizations in the world in terms of revenue raise most of their money through uh, retail, small individual donor. And uh, so you will see that uh, it's very, very clear. It's very, very predominant. It's much more powerful than uh, any other uh, you know, fundraising uh, opportunities that you have uh, just because of the sheer volume. And if you even if you look at the overall uh, fundraising, uh, the charitable money that is raised around the world for all organization, for all costs, three fourth of the money actually comes from uh, individuals. And uh, even if you take the Indian context, if you look at uh, uh, the last 18 months during the pandemic, maximum number of Indians actually ended up giving for a human tragedy. Uh, many new Indians started to give uh, for uh, non-profit causes, irrespective of all kind of imagination that exists about the development world uh, in India or elsewhere. Uh, and also the other thing I wanted to say that uh, uh, because of I pro bono's background and the kind of work that they do uh, around the area of justice, etc., many of these organizations, I have, I have uh, deliberately mentioned some names here like Greenpeace, Amnesty, Oxfam, although they don't qualify as the largest revenue generating organizations in the world. So, but I have, these are some of the big names they might not be the biggest, but they probably are the most celebrated ones in terms of the impact of their work, in terms of you know, changing global relations, dynamics, laws, et cetera, et cetera. So, and these are extremely complex of work and complex organization. So when you are in doing this type of work, when you are working on very, very complex social change issues and not necessarily what Noshir called service delivery issues. Uh, so if you are working on such complex issues of justice, uh, etc., then uh, it has been seen that it's collective social societal collective action, which actually pushes, uh, pushes uh, or brings in social change. It was never big donations from, you know, very, very rich people or rich corporations, etc. It was always millions of people standing together for a common cause. So the, uh, you know, for civilizational reasons. And this is, when I say collective action, I mean citizenry. And uh, yeah. historically it has always been seen that, you know, when a lot of people start to do something, it becomes a norm and then gradually a tradition. That is the way these organizations work and that is why they pursue uh, small individual donor very, very vigorously. The last thing I wanted to discuss that in, given all this context that uh, we have now, how do you make a fundraising choice? Let's say you are a social movement or a small charity that exists in Manipur and working for local communities. So how do you take fundraising decisions or how does a charity take a decision while they pursue fundraising in terms of what kind of fundraising I would do. Should I do corporate? Should I do foundation? Should I do high net worth? Should I do event? Should I do merchandise? Or should I do retail, digital, crowdfunding, whatever. So usually there are five parameters. So this is a sort of a design thinking. So there are five parameters which actually will help you to brainstorm and find out conceptually what is best suited and where are you what where are you placed in terms of pursuing a certain type of fundraising so these are the five parameters and i can share all these details with diksha later which probably will be useful so very very quickly 
uh, strategic means. So you know what happens when, because there are shifts in the way organizations are funding charities now, uh, for example, we spoke about capping the administrative expense. Look at what has happened to FCRA, etc. So this is systematically weakening the sector. So what is happening that uh, because they have, you know, very specifically told you to where you can actually spend your money how and how much. So the autonomy has been taken away in terms of taking strategic decisions, for example, you might find that you have to spend a lot of money in monitoring to actually improve the quality of, of, of your work. Uh, take the case of looking at salary as administrative expense. So if, if you were Sharva Shiksha Abhiyan, if you were a charity, and if your project was Sharva Shiksha Abhiyan, then you would never get FCRA money or no funding from any UN agencies because 75% of Sharva Shiksha fund goes in teacher salaries. So that's a very stupid and funny and naive way of interpreting. And obviously it has been done for different uh, purpose. So when in these complexities, you have to think about how will you raise your unrestricted funds as well. So, so these kind of deliberations could help you to determine what kind of fundraising you should pursue. And if you go by these parameters and analyze these top five fundraising uh, um, channels that are uh, or avenues that are available around the world and in India. This is how this is how it uh, looks like. So when I was working with Azim Premji Philanthropic Initiative, we used to give a lot of grant to hundreds of charities, and we did some workshop. And around twenty five charities actually conducted this analysis on their own. We told them it's a very simple scoring method with some brainstorming. So the idea is bigger the square, better it is. So it's a spider graph. So bigger the graph, better it is. And after you know many deliberations, we found that uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, so this is a context I wanted to give you in terms of how you possibly could make these uh, critical fundraising choices. Diksha, back to you. Thank you so much, Rajesh. Um, I'll now ask Norshir to speak. And then after he's done, we can take some questions from the group. Thank you. Norshir, you're on mute. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'll switch off my video and try to bring my PowerPoint in. Okay, uh, so I'm back again, and I will probably be speaking for another 30 minutes. I have now to cover a fairly wide gamut, but I will try to put it together in 30 minutes about certain legal compliances that everybody needs to know and understand, and the issue of also fundraising tied into that. So let us start with, I left last with income and uh, therefore, to understand what is income of a voluntary organization is absolutely key. Where does a voluntary organization or NGO or whatever term you have decided to call yourself get its income from? So, you could be getting your income from individuals. And trust me, I mean, there are surveys across the world and now even in India, which says that India is probably potentially ready for a lot of what we can call tail fundraising, where individuals now have enough power to give. And these not only include NIs, that is the high net worth individuals, but also through cash box donations that can be put at public places, including your own NGOs, bequests, that is people leaving you money in their wills, or door-to-door -door collection, which is again called retail fundraising. Today, there are a number of online portals. You can do fundraising through crowdfunding. You could create a on your own website. You could use Dana Mojo. You could use any of those portals, uh, social media, 
people are very happy to use social media such as Facebook, Twitter, etc., also to raise money, uh, including their own website. <coughs> Self generated is also possible through fees for services, sale of products made by your beneficiaries, uh, events, fundraising events. If you have a uh, land building etc then renting that out and getting income interest through your investments that you make uh, in certain approved funds etc where companies are concerned with their corporate foundations employee giving is also a growing trend and of course csr which is the big picture right now csr has been as you know mandated under the indian companies act 2013 uh, which has come into effect from 1st of April 2014. We are already now close to six, seven years now of CSR being mandated in this country for con uh, companies that have a certain turnover or have a certain uh, net worth or at least a profit of five crores and more. For CSR, you as an organization need to be registered either as a trust society or a Section 8 company. You need to have a track record of at least three years of service. You need to have both 12A and PG registration with income, which is introduced now only under uh, the company's policy rules of 2021. And an additional requirement is that you need to go to the registrar of companies portal, obtain a unique identification in a form called CSR1. It's a fairly simple form. You can do it on your own or you could you ask your chartered accountant to do it for. So the criteria for eligibility of CSR is that you have to be a trust society or a Section 8 company, any one of this, have a track record of at least three of service. That means you should have been around and doing uh, your charitable activities. Uh, you need to have both 12A and ADG, which was not the case until January 2021 when the company CSR policy rules came in. So now both 12A and ADG is mandatory. Uh, and you have to get this unique identification number on the Ministry of Corporate Affairs portal called CSR1. And after that, you would be eligible for CSR. It's the equivalent of saying, I have an MBA now, do I get a job? I mean, you have to be looking out for your donors. There was a question in the chat box that I saw, will the companies come for you? Usually that doesn't happen. You will have to be looking for those companies. So, uh, but we have reached where there is now adequate respect in the corporate sector for the nonprofit sector. And the nonprofit sector is also building its respect for companies. So there is uh, a certain partnership that is developing thanks to CSR, and which is good and which is very encouraging. Of course, there is also chill overseas. The diaspora is our uh, uh, NRIs who are residing abroad, always chapters that you might think in terms of creating where uh, people in the USA might be donating. You might be interested in setting up a 5C3 or the equivalent in other countries. Uh, where people would give to friends of your organization, association that you might create over there so that they can get the tax deductibility in that country. But you will, of course, need FCRA registration in India to receive all that money. But of course, government is also a possible source of fundraising. Uh, it could be the state government scheme or it could be central government scheme or you might be into if you are an environmental organization on waste management or on recycling, et cetera, through your municipal corporations, et cetera. So this is the universe in terms of your sources of funding. Now, in terms of the type of donations that you can get, you could probably get what is called a general contribution, which is often referred to as unrestricted money. Somebody just says, here is a rupees or 500 rupees. It's to generally support the work of your organization. This is called unrestricted, where uh, an individual donor usually is giving it to you because they believe in your work and they want to support work. The second type is the year mark where you might be working for education of both girls and boys, but the donor is only interested in you specifically supporting the education of the girl child. And that is what is called year mark. That means the donor specifies that this money will be used only for the girl or a a uh, challenge child or whatever the case may be. Then, of course, there is matching contribution where uh, a donor might say your project cost you 
uh, 50 lakhs of rupees. Well, I'm committing 25 lakhs of rupees, provided you collect another 25 lakhs from your community. This is often referred to also as a challenge grant, where the donor is testing your credibility and your competence to raise money. This is not too popular, but it certainly is one of the things that happens. And of course, there is corpus. Corpus is where a donor gives you money as a capital receipt for you. The requirement of the law is that the donor must express that intended writing, where the donor says that this money is towards corpus. Now, what happens when a donor gives you a corpus decision is that it is not treated as income in your income and expenditure statement. It goes straight into your balance sheet as a capital receipt. And uh, this money is supposed to stay there. And now under the Finance Act of 2021, it is said that if a donor gives you a corpus donation, it must be also tagged to the donor. So let's say ABC has given you a lack of rubies towards corpus, you will immediately create a fixed deposit or some kind of investment, a permissible investment, and tag it to the donor that this is the corpus donation of ABC. Uh, so in your books of accounts, uh, it will be tagged uh, to the donor's name. Uh, this is uh, a very recent change that came about under the Finance Act of 2021. And of course, there are reserves that you can create because the income tax law requires that in any given fiscal year, uh, which begins in India on 1st of April, ends on 31st March, you have to spend at least 85% of your total income earned on your objects, including admin costs. But the balance 15% can be created by way of a reserve fund. Now, we saw even last year in the pandemic that organizations that really survived were the ones who actually had built up a corpus or a reserve because while there was back on funds and uh, donations that they were getting, they were able to dig into their corpus for survival and uh, keeping some of the activities uh, which were funded because you know there was a lot of funding that went towards COVID relief uh, and rehabilitation as versus whatever else you were doing and therefore i think it is quite important for organizations to think in terms of building costs and reserves so it's a very important point uh, that i thought i would bring up today when we are talking of fundraising then you also need to understand a very specific difference between these term called donation and grant both are interchangeably used by people but they have a difference what do you find in these two circle intersecting is yes both donation and grants are in the nature of a gift to your organization but a donation is free and unrestricted contribution where the donor says do whatever you like with this donation you can use it to pay your electricity bill your telephone bill do whatever you want it's unrestricted grant is usually very specific that means the donor says you have to utilize it within this period of time uh, you will use only so much on travel only so much on admin you will report back to me, you will give me quarterly reports, you will half yearly reports, you will give me annual reports. So a grant is very specific and restricted. So the difference between a donation and a grant is both are in the nature of a gift, but a grant is more specific in terms of terms and conditions which are imposed upon the recipient organization. Now we come to income tax, uh, which is a uh, slightly bit of a compliance. And even in the previous session, somebody asked me that, uh, should I go in for 12A and ADG? I think it is important because now you need to receive CSR grant, getting your registration under 12A, that is income tax recognizing you as an organization, which is tax exempt is very important because it means that whatever donations, grants that you will be tax free for your organization. And of course, ATG is a benefit that you will give indirectly to the donor. ATG is of no real consequence to your organization. Uh, if you have ATG, your donor will be able to get a tax deduction up to 50% uh, on income, which is liable tax for that particular donor. So now let's look at this very important slide. And in literally this one slide, you will understand what income tax for charitable organizations or nonprofits is all about. So the first principle you need to understand is that if you are a trust society or a section eight company and which has got its 12-way registration, there is no tax for that institution. But the rest which you read is the provided, which means what are the things you need to keep in mind? First, your organization, trust society or a section eight company needs to obtain a PAN. PAN means a permanent account number. It's a one-time access. Most of you probably have it. 
Second is you also need to have a TAN, which is a tax deduction account number. This is for purpose of TDS. You would be uh, deducting tax at source for your employee salaries or to consultants or to contractors, etc. So having a PAN and a TAN, this is a one-time exercise and you get these numbers. Uh, the other thing is you have to be registered <laughs> if you wish to be tax exempt under section 12 AA, which is now referred to as section 12 AB. And all organizations already registered under 12 AA are supposed to revalidate this now. And the due date for that happens to be the end of this month, 8th of August. So if you have not already done it, please do that. There were certain glitches on the new income tax portal, uh, which uh, was launched on 1st of Ju uh, July, uh, but uh, it was almost inoperable for 50 days. Uh, but now uh, it's uh, up and running. It has some glitches, but do go for revalidation of your 12A and ADG. Then to continue being a tax exempt organization, your institution must be operating for charitable purpose only. We've explained to you earlier what charitable purpose is, those six categories. And your activities must be for activities in India and as per the objects of your organization. So this is a very loaded statement. You must be existing for charitable purpose, relief of poverty, education, medical relief, any other of uh, general public utility. Your activities must be in India only. You cannot be running these activities outside of India. And as per your objects, you cannot stray from your objects. If your objects are purely educational, you cannot be getting into medical relief. So you have to work within the objects of your organization. Otherwise, this can affect your tax exam status. The next requirement is that in any given fiscal year, minimum 85% of your total income which you receive a year must be spent. Or income tax says you must apply minimum 85% of your income on the of your organization, including admin costs or admin overheads, whichever way you want to look at it. So assuming you got about a crore of rupees worth of donations, grants, including the interest income that you earned in the year, minimum 85 lakhs have to be spent. Balance 15 lakhs, you can put it into a reserve fund for a rainy day if you want, but the minimum requirement of 85% is there. You can spend 100% also, that's not a problem, but the minimum action of income, 85%. Then if you invest any of your funds, including your reserve funds, plus donations, they must be only in permissible investments. You cannot invest in shares and stocks. You can only invest in bank FDs and certain approved mutual funds, etc or an HDFC trust deposit scheme or ICICI, uh, uh, those kinds of, there are certain permissible investments. Uh, there's a list of that. Uh, and the trustees and the relatives do not derive any personal benefit. This is provision of section 13 specific that trustee relatives or anyone who's on your board and the relatives should not be deriving personal benefit. This is not to be confused with remuneration, uh, which may be allowed as provided your own constitutions allows for remuneration and meet the test of reasonableness. And if there is any business income that is arising, if you happen to be under category number six, which I talked to you about in the earlier session, it should not exceed 20% of your uh, total income in that fiscal year. Now, with regard to ATG, ATG is a direct benefit to it's an indirect benefit that the donor enjoys. It's a donor incentive. If an ADG is certificate, the donor is entitled to a tax deduction. Again, this is of course cost etc. And you need to revalidate your Wait, ADG sorry. certificate. Sorry, could you just repeat sorry. That sentence? Please, your voice broke. All right. I'm really sorry about this. No, uh, no, it was really great. It was just this one sentence. Thank you. All right. So ADG is a direct benefit, uh, which is you are incentivizing the donor to give you a contribution, and the donor is entitled to a 50% tax deduction on his or her's income, which is liable tax. Uh, this is only for the donor's knowledge, and it, it does not concern you, that, that ADG benefit is only up to 10% of the donor's income. Uh, it cannot exceed that. This is the donor's worry, so you don't get too carried away into this requirement as revalidating the certificate before the end of this month. That is by 30th of August, unless that decides to further extend that period, but otherwise the due date for revalidation 
of your existing 12A, that is tax exemption and tax deduction certificate under ATG happens to be <coughs> end of this month, that is 30th of August. Again, in-kind contributions such as computers, medical equipment, vehicles, etc., do not qualify for ATG. Let's say a donor says, I'm contributing brand computers, laptops for your education program. I'm afraid you cannot say, okay, the value of this donation is so and so. The donor has to give you a sum of money. And he can, the donor can give you money and say, buy 10 computers with it or five computers with that money. That's fine. But in-kind contributions do not qualify for tax deduction under ATG. So it has to be a sum of money. The other requirement that happened in the demonetization period, uh, that is 2017, that any donation given in cash over 2000 rupees will not be tax deduction by the donor under ATG. This is that if somebody gave you even a crore of rupees by check or through an NEFT transfer or an RTGS transfer, that is all right. But if somebody walks into your office and says, I'm giving you 10,000 rupees in cash, you know, he takes out the wallet and gives you 10,000 on the table. Yes, you can technically take it, but any contribution over 2000 in cash is not tax deductible for the donor. So he would give you 10 rupees in cash, but the tax stability will remit, uh, remain limited to only 2000 rupees. Of course, under income tax right now, cash transactions have an upper limit of not more than two lakhs in a day. So technically, and I'm telling your organization to do that, but you can even receive cash donation of up to two lakhs from a single donor in a day. Please don't do that. But what I mean to say, I'm just getting into the technicality of it. So, uh, but for ADG purpose, it cannot be more than 2000 from one single donor. Your compliance requirement is in every fiscal year, ensure that you file your income tax return in a form called ITR7 before the due date. It's usually end of October, including an audit report to be produced by your auditor, your statutory auditor in a form called form number 10B. Uh, please revalidate your 12A and ADG certificate. The form for that is uh, a form called form number 10A. And uh, when you will get your renewed 12A and ADG, now it will be for a maximum period of five years. Every five years now, you'll have to go for revalidation of your 12A and ADG certificate. Uh, when you're filling up form 10A, very basic documents are asked for your registration certificate, a copy of your constitution, your registration certificate under FCRA, if you're registered under FCRA, your old 12A certificate, audited statement of accounts, note of activities, registration under NGO Darpan, if you are registered under that, details of assets, liabilities as on the date of application. Let your chartered accountant do this. It's a form called form number 10. It's an online process. It's the same form for 12A ATG. Technically, first fill up form 10A for revalidating your 12A registration, and then use that same form again after exiting to re reapply for your ATG as well. And then you'll <clears throat> get a certificate renewed or revalidated for a period. It's under what is known in income tax as a straight through process. No questions will be asked. There'll be no inquiry. If you have uploaded the documents correctly, you will immediately get it or literally in the matter of the next few days. So, uh, but please do this before 30th of August. Coming to the concluding part, I want to very quickly and very briefly try to deal with Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. I'm conscious of the fact that this may not be applicable to many NGOs who may be participating today, but nonetheless, you need to know the consequences. <coughs> If you are receiving money from any foreign source, this law applies. But if you're not, if you are, all your contributions are restricted to Indian donors, uh, companies, et cetera, you may completely forget about this act. And trust me, sleep better if you do not have to comply with the requirements of this law. So FCRA is a piece of legislation uh, that was first introduced in the year 1976. Uh, it's an old piece of legislation. Uh, thereafter came the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act of 2010, and it's gone undergone several amendments from 2010 onwards, including a very major change that happened in the rules of 2015. But the most important changes happened actually last year itself in the month of September, where we had the brand new Foreign Contribution Amendment Act 2020, 
and the foreign contribution amendment rules of 2020. I'll quickly run through all the changes that happened. So the Foreign Contribution Regulation Amendment Act of 2020 has come into effect from 29th of September 2020. Let me quickly give you the highlights. One of the first thing that changed is no subgranting. If you are an organization registered under the CRA law, you have to use money received from foreign sources directly on your own. You cannot give it to another organization, even if they are registered under FCRA. Earlier, prior to this amendment, you could give it to an organization also registered under FCRA. But now, even if the organize, so your organization A registered under FCRA, you receive foreign contribution. You cannot give it to organization B, even if it has FCRA, which was earlier permitted. Now, any foreign contribution received must be utilized by your organization directly on your own. So no subgranting. That's the first change that happened. The other is this restriction and which our earlier speaker also referred to that there is now a cap on admin expenditure. Please understand this cap of admin expenditure is only restricted to your foreign contribution. It has no bearing or consequences on your local money. It says that not more than 20% of the foreign contribution received will be spent on admin expenditure. This, I repeat, is only restricted to your foreign contributions, not your local contributions. But what is admin expenditure? If you will look at rule number five, it gives you the list of what is foreign expenditure. Salaries and wages, travel expenditures, remuneration of your board members, uh, expenses toward hiring of personnel. That means anyone who's in the admin side of your organization, legal and professional charges, etc. But there are two provisions that are given. And this is a screenshot of rule number five. I'll be happy to share it with I pro bono. So you look at it more in detail later on. But there are two exempting provisions. Rule number five says that all expenses towards hiring of personnel for the management of activities of the person and salaries, wages of any kind of remuneration paid, including cost of travel to such personnel. Uh, it says, provided that expenditure incurred on salaries or remuneration of personnel engaged in training or for collection or analysis of field data of an association primarily engaged in research will not be counted for its admin costs. The most important one over here, further that expenses incurred directly in furtherance of the stated objectives of a welfare-oriented organization shall be excluded from the administrative expenses, such as salaries to doctors of a hospital and salaries to teachers of a school. It's an indicative list given over here that salaries that you pay to teachers does not fall under admin costs for the purpose of FCRA. This is very clearly provided under rule number five. You can uh, Go to the Ministry of Home Affairs website and download the Bayer Act and the rules, and you'll find it over there. The teacher salaries counts as a program expenditure and not as an admin expenditure. And even if you have, and it says such as, so I mean, if you have anyone who's actually implementing your program, uh, then salaries paid to anyone who's implementing the program will not fall under admin costs. So. The other provisions that they have brought in is that you're uh, based on a, just a summary inquiry. If they find that your organization is defaulting, they can freeze your bank account, etc. So that's the provision that they brought in. Uh, all those who are on your board, it says all office bearers, directors, and other key functionaries must provide as identification document their Aadhaar number. So having Aadhaar and disclosing the Aadhaar number to the Ministry of Home Affairs under the FCRA has now become mandatory for all your board members. If you are a trust, they are the board of trustees. If you are a Section 8 company, board of directors, including your CEO, if the CEO happens to be chief functionary. Your organization earlier could have been suspended only for half a year. Now it is suspended for literally the whole year, 360 days earlier it was. Uh, in case of any violation of FCRA, they have extended it from 180 days to now 360 days. Uh, earlier on, there was no provision for voluntary surrender of your FCRA. This has also been brought in. But the sad side is that if you surrender your FCRA, any assets that you have created out of your foreign contribution, which means computers, uh, it may be equipment, it may be schools, colleges, land building, these must vest in a competent government authority. That means this will now vest in the central government, the Ministry of Home Affairs. So 
this is a very draconian piece uh, of change that has happened over here and is of great concern in fact uh, uh, it, it, it's a very serious issue for many of us who are creating assets out of foreign contributions to keep this in mind. And of course, naturally, if your FCRA has been cancelled by the Ministry of Home Affairs, then also your assets, your FCRA has created assets, including land, building, uh, vehicles, equipment, etc., would vest in a competent government authority. This is how the law has been amended from last year. And uh, now, even when you will go in for your renewal of FCRA, There'll be a very detailed inquiry that will happen in terms of your activities. There'll be uh, ID officers that will be coming to check your activities. They might come at your project or program site, et cetera, to check on your activities, et cetera. Uh, and now, of course, a very major change is uh, that uh, all foreign contributions must be received in a designated FCRA account, which has to be the State Bank of India, New Delhi main branch. Uh, you don't have to make a trip to Delhi. You can do it to a local branch of the State Bank of India. But all foreign contributions must come into your State Bank of India, New Delhi main branch. Of course, you can retain your old FCRA account as an additional FCRA account. There is a process for that. I'm not going to get into the technicalities unless somebody has questions about this. And then very quickly about the rules, foreign contribution regulation amendment rules of 2020. These have come into effect from 10th November 2020. If your organization is of a political nature, you cannot be eligible for FCRA. And they have now defined what is political nature. If your organization is participating in any active politics or party politics, as the case may be, then you will be deemed to be an organization of a political nature. This is one of the good things that has come under the rules, because at least they have once and for all defined what is political nature. Uh, the other amendment is with regard to uh, uh, your eligibility for registration. Uh, earlier on, you had to be three years old, which is a, still a requirement to be eligible for FCRA registration. You need to be three years old. But earlier requirement was you should have spent at least 10 lakhs of rupees on your core activities. Now that has been increased to 15 lakhs of rupees. You, you must meet both these criteria in order to be eligible for FCRA. For prior permission also, they have made certain changes over here in terms of receiving the money only in various stages, et cetera. Your renewal will have to go through a very detailed process. And for renewal, the form number is called FC3C. Uh, the fees for prior permission is 5,000 rupees. For renewal, 5,000 rupees. And for a new registration, 10,000. This can be paid by debit card or credit card uh, of any of your board members or your CEO. And you can take a reimbursement for these fees pays, but it has to be an online uh, or you can use net banking to pay this to the government of India, Ministry of Home Affairs in that regard. Key compliances post the 2020 amendment is Darpan ID is now requirement. Darpan ID is the unique identification number that you get by going to the NITI IO portal. Hopefully some of you have it. If you don't have it, it's a fairly easy process. Uh, uh, open your designated bank account only with State Bank of India, New Delhi main branch. Uh, uh, the deadline is way past. It was earlier 1st April, then it again got extended till June. But now we are way past it for organizations already registered under FCRA. Uh, fill form FC6C within 15 days of opening the bank account with State Bank of India. Uh, An Aadhaar of all your key members is made very important. So very quickly now, I'll talk about some FCRA fundamentals, last two or three slides, and then I can wind up for question and answers. So please understand the fundamental of FCRA is that foreign contribution could be received as a donation, delivery or transfer by a foreign source. Very often, think only if you receive money in dollars or in sterling or in dirhams or any of the foreign currency, it's a foreign contribution. The answer is, that foreign sources talked about under FCRA and not foreign currency. And if you receive money from a foreign source, it can come to you in the form of money, which could be Indian rupees or in foreign exchange. It could be an article. That means a foreign source could be sending you computers. Uh, they could be sending you relief material, or they could be giving you a share or a stock. The key compliances under FCRA is you need to maintain separate books of accounts for FCRA or at least a cost center in your tally system. No foreign national should be on your board. OCIs or PIOs will be tolerated, but no foreign national should be on your board. 
and uh, fees or commercial receipts that you will get will not be treated as FCRA, which is good, but please keep in mind the income tax point where your business income should not be more than 20%. And foreign contribution must not be invested in mutual uh, funds, uh, specifically disallowed. So please ensure that if you are making any investment of your foreign contributions, they are on bank FDs, preferably with the State Bank of India, you will be safer with that. Uh, ensure that you do quarterly intimation of your foreign contributions on the ministry's website, preferably. You can do it on your own website as well. Make sure annually you file your returns uh, with the Ministry of Home Affairs in form number FC4 by 31st of December. Even in years when you receive no foreign contribution, ensure that you file a nil return. This is very important. Uh, you often feel that, you know, this year we didn't receive any foreign contribution, so why should I file a return? Every year, FC4 has to be filed, even if you have received zero foreign contribution, that is a nil return is absolutely mandatory. And FCRA statement of account should also be uh, uploaded on your own organization's website. It may be one of the compliance requirements that ministry will check when renewing your FCRA. Uh, if you have received any articles, make sure you have filled up form number FC1. And any income generated from FCI asset that means if you have a school that you have created out of uh, FCI funds, all the income that you generate as a school will have to be accounted for under FCRA. Although it will be paid by Indian students and Indian rupees, it must all go into your FCRA statement of accounts and into your FCRA bank account. These are the important forms for you to all know. Uh, if there is any change or name or address of your organization, it is called Form FC6A. If you have changed any of your objects, we talked about it in the earlier session, it's called Form FC6B. Uh, if there is any change in your bank account, the form is fc 6 uh, For any additional bank accounts that you created uh, for utilization of your FCRA funds, it's Form number FC6D. And if there is any change in your board member, earlier it was only if more than 50% of your board changes, you needed to fill this up. Now, even if there is one new appointment or somebody gets off your board, you have to fill up form number FC6E. And this is probably the final slide, which is a very important test. Funds received from a non-resident Indian. Is it a foreign contribution? It may happen that somebody from the UAE is sending you from overseas. Uh, sending it to you. It's an Indian, remember, holding Indian boats, sending it to you from the UAE in dirhams. Well, the good news is it's not foreign contribution because this person is not uh, a citizen of UAE, happens to be an Indian citizen. And therefore, I repeat, currency is not the test from which country it came is not the test. If this person is an MRI sending you money from the UAE or the UAE, as long as the person is Indian, it is not a foreign contribution. Now, OCI, that's another thing. Now, an OCI is an overseas citizen of uh, India, which means has taken on citizenship of the country. It could be the UK, it could be the USA, and gives you money from his NRE account or NRO account in India in Indian rupees. Well, the bad news is that it is a foreign contribution. So a citizen of a foreign country obviously is a foreign source. Uh, companies having more than 50% shareholding now is treated uh, as uh, an Indian local source, which was not the case until the amendment happened a few years ago. So even if uh, there is shareholding of more than 50% of FII and FDIs in an Indian company, that doesn't make it a foreign source, which was the case earlier, but now is not the case. And again, even if it's a subsidiary of a foreign company, as long as it is registered under the Indian Companies Act, it will not be treated as uh, a foreign contribution. So with that, uh, I know I've slightly exceeded my time, but I'm going to stop the screen share, turn my video on, and I'll be happy to take questions. I'm sorry I had to rush it because I had to cover a whole gamut of uh, issues, but uh, uh, happy to take questions from this point on, including for my colleague speaker with me. So what do you, Diksha, to anchor this part now? Yes. Sorry, I was very rushed. And sorry if my voice faltered in between. Apologies yet again. No, actually, your voice was pretty good in this run. Thank you. And um, 
of course it had to be rushed there was a lot for you to co cover uh, so um, in any if anyone has any questions about a specific portion that they felt was not adequately covered you can send a question in the in the chat box um, and uh, in case we can't cover all the questions we'll try to address them in the note that we passed around after the session is over um, Rajesh is hey, 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 take questions for Rajesh first I need a breather <laughs> there's a lot I cover <laughs> that's fair that's fair Rajesh shall we start with you then um, yeah. One of the questions someone has asked is in terms of the framework provided by you on kinds of nonprofits, liberal, realist, and Marxist, where do the ones with a conservative lens come in? So, when you say conservative, what do you mean? Do you mean in the context of morality, faith, what? Or politics? I would imagine that they mean political. So, that's the realists. Okay, so that would be realist. Yeah. So even if, uh, yeah, if it's a political view or then it's a realist. Okay. Um, and someone has asked, if I get a project from the government to work on five, to work for five crores on supporting a deprived community, am I liable to pay tax if I don't have a 12-way registration? So no, she will be the best person. I think if you don't have 12-way, you wouldn't be taxable. Yeah, uh, I agree, Rajesh. You're right uh, that there would be a because 12A means you're tax exempt. Don't have it, it means you're a taxable entity. You might be taxed as an AOP, registered AOP, or usually that is the form. So, yes, you would come under the maximum marginal rate of tax, which is 30%. As yes, I mean, the total income of your organization, not just the government grant, uh, would be liable to tax. But you pay tax only if you make profit, right? Yeah, I mean, there would be certain deductions that you would be able to claim on expenditures, etc. But I mean, what is important for you to know, there might be income than that also. There may have been a lot of donors having given you money also. All total income is liable to tax, not just the government income. Yeah. So that's the idea. Okay. And the next question... You your income for taxes is a story altogether. The, the point raised is, do we, are we a taxable entity? Yes. In the absence of a 12A, you are a taxable entity. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, Rajesh, there's another question for you. How do donors find out whether the money and time is going to the intended beneficiaries or not? Are there best practices framed around this? So there is something in the question which is intended beneficiaries, right? Mm -hmm. And what was the second part of the question? How do donors find out whether the money and time is going to intended beneficiaries? Are there best practices framed around this? Huh. So the, the key thing is intended beneficiaries and how the entity, I mean, the NGO is communicating to its donor in terms of what type of work they do, where the expenditures are happening and, and how it is linked to the beneficiary. So this is a classic uh, problem uh, which the sector has been facing for over three to four decades now. In the 80s, the Atlantic magazine in the US came out with a concept. They coined a term which was called the starvation cycle. So imagine you are, let's say, educating a child in a very remote area from a deprived section of the society. So if you are now saying that only the money that is spent on buying the books, getting a teacher, getting a tuition, paying for the school fee, that is intended to the beneficiary uh, and not uh, expenses like someone who has actually identified the, you know, most deserving child. So it's all about uh, how you are uh, communicating and how you are classifying. Uh, that's what I said, uh, purpose driven fundraising is about uh, uh, the, if, the, if the donor understand your work very well, even the electricity bill that you pay, that is also intended for your beneficiary. And that's the level of uh, communication uh, you have to get into. So there is something called what is the cost per beneficiary and that is something that many donors are very keen on knowing that I mean per beneficiary I mean how much of the rupee really goes in. There are organizations who actually do this of a, a performance audit you know there are even organizations called 
called there is one that i know of called helpyourngo.com and which does an actual financial audit on how much is actual spent on admin and how much really goes as beneficiary cost etc so uh, there are various matrix that are used by, and can be used yeah but you know so there there is a book by jim collins called good to great i'll be very brief because i know time so in that book he has argued this point uh, very effectively and has challenged this notion of uh, uh, evaluating an ngo based on uh, their cost etc and uh, so he said that this actually happens because of because of the of a confusion between imagining money as my input and output so if you were a if you were wipro where i used to work and you were manufacturing soap money is an important input for you how much money you are actually spending to produce a soap and money will also be an important out, output for you in terms of how much money you are actually making by selling that soap but if you were an ngo money will be an important input for you for producing that soap but how can money be an important output uh, output for you where you are not supposed to make profit by selling that soap so this is a very funny debate that is going on and uh, it has been uh, there are many view which contradicts that uh, that is not a great lens for example return on investment is not a great kpi to assess the efficacy of fundraising but obviously there are organizations like uh, noshir said that they do uh, apply this scale to uh, acquire very very large uh, funds and grants thank you for that um and the next question for you rajesh is what do you suggest as the top one or two funding sources for a state level education ngo so if you are an education ngo i mean obviously it's a, it will it will probably qualify as a service delivery organization even if you are working for literacy you know so and if you are a state level organization uh, it really depends on which state you are into so usually for education it's not that difficult to uh, get funds from corporates grants uh, philanthropists uh, even high net worths mm. so these are the three most uh, predominant sources which funds uh, the education sector in india this is the most funded sector i would say safely in in fact the hcl report on csr indicates that uh, much of csr money is going primarily to education and to healthcare yes. it's the other sectors which are neglected such as the care of the elderly sports uh, uh, arts uh, culture those are the more neglected areas but yes. education and healthcare need from function of csr or for that matter even foreign contributions i mean uh, it takes so i mean it should not be too difficult if you are in these two spheres even fcra money is quite uh, yes no, on education largely yes okay thank you um and then related to the topic of fundraising a second question we received was being an ngo we really struggle to have a constant flow of funds so can we invest ngo money in the bond market or fixed income instruments and get a constant flow of money from there is this legal uh so the investment mode is very clearly specified under section 115 of the income tax act offline i'll be happy to share with you what are the uh, investment options that you have uh yes you have an option to invest uh, at least as per the income tax and mutual funds uh, you can go for uh, equity based or liquid funds uh, uh, it's a long topic uh, investment by itself but there are various options uh, but of course if you are for foreign conditions then fcra says you cannot invest in mutual funds at all or you cannot put in any speculative investment if you happen to be in states like maharashtra the charity commissioner says you cannot invest in invest money in any mutual fund it has to be only a debt based mutual fund so this is all very subjective which state you are in etc so uh, this is a subjective answer but uh, yes you can look beyond fds also there is also a possibility uh, you can consider hdfc trust deposit scheme uh, which has a rating uh, and a 
decent in today's time return that you can get no sure i think we've lost you your voice is breaking a little bit what we'll do though is we'll speak to nosher about uh, exactly which sort of investments are possible and we'll add that to the note that we circulate for everyone so if anyone wants to know further details they can they can keep an eye out for that uh rajesh in the meantime uh, one of the questions that's raised is how can we best raise funds during the initial years of the organization what kind of institutions should we approach at the 0 to 3 year stage of our organization yeah very interesting question so yeah. when you are the initial students uh, this is the most difficult period because uh, particularly in india credibility is a very big factor they will look at your track record so if you go to a big uh, grant making organization they will also look at your three year history and all that but there are more progressive grant making organizations in india now for example azim premji philanthropic initiative has uh, actually a grant making uh, policy whereby absolutely new organizations can be funded up to 1 crore without looking at so you know it's uh, past record and all that and uh, we you, we coin that project as good people doing great work continue to fund them mm. so so there was no there is no requirement of submitting any previous balance sheet etc we will look at your idea and if we share that idea we will just fund you so that still exists uh, there will be other grant making organizations which i am sure thinking in this manner corporate will be difficult csr will not will always look at three year trajectory probably uh, they also have uh, you know other market related uh, kind of uh, motivations while they do csr funding in terms of what brand you are etc etc where you are geography so the one of the so obviously grants uh, the strongest mean is your own network so there is a concept uh, a modern concept in fundraising which we call cult so all these ngos which has been formed traditionally year after year decade after decade you will see that uh, they, many of them were founder driven and all these organizations have a cult following because of the founder and the core idea so you follow your cult find your cult and uh, even if there are 100 people Uh, who you can identify who actually believe in that core ideology that which you are perceiving uh, and even if these 100 people start giving you 1000 rupees a month for 5 year that's a lot of money so recurring giving from your cult small sums of giving uh, every month that could go a long way okay thank you uh so, sorry i lost my internet connection i am using my mobile device and uh, uh just trying to join in for the last few minutes no worries oh uh, we just uh, had a couple of more questions for rajesh so that's fine thank you nashir yeah you. sorry about that i think my internet really failed me today <laughs> sorry <laughs> about that it always chooses the worst days to do that i you bet you bet i mean it just runs so beautifully on days when you don't have a webinar <laughs> or i need me i'm using my mobile device and uh, thank god i'm connected and i finished with the ppts at least so now i can <laughs> the questions that yeah. be on this one yes indeed 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 yeah tell me uh, or you can just continue with rajesh whatever that rajesh was speaking about yes uh, so that was, i mean rajesh had just finished answering a question um nosh another your back i'll very quickly just ask you one uh, if you've already met 20% of total receipts allowed for fees for service but still want to do projects which are generating revenue for the organization are there any alternative possibilities is a fee for service the only way to receive funds from government partnership projects so i mean government usually enters into what is called works contract with you so there is an element of tds and gst etc so i i've noticed that happening so uh, well you can even in such cases where you fear that you might uh, lose your tax exempt status you might decide in terms of having a dual entity that is you have a non profit and you also create a for profit entity through which you will be actually so you might create perhaps let us say a private limited company 
who has objects such as whatever you might be doing with the government in terms of waste management or recycling, etc. And uh, let the government, uh, I mean, you then consider yourself a for-profit social enterprise. Uh, and uh, you enter into works contract through that. I mean, uh, receive those monies. I mean, carry out those works and leave your non-profit organization completely undeterred by this. And so you can, in, you can do all your commercial activities through that for-profit and you leave your non-profit only to receive pure grants, donations, etc., leaving your tax exempt status very intact. So this is a model that many are using, which is uh, people mistakenly call it a hybrid model, but there is no such thing as a hybrid model. That is one entity can do both. You have to cre create two separate entities that can run parallelly, and which means that you have a non-profit model uh, only to receive donations and grants and a for-profit model uh, to receive those kinds of works contracts, service contracts, etc. Yeah. Exactly. Right. exactly. This is what uh, we did uh, at Amnesty when we started. There you are. Exactly. 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 Okay. All right. Um, and then somebody has asked, after getting foreign funds in the SBI FCRA account, can that amount be transferred to a local account belonging to the NGO? Certainly. The, there is a process laid down that you first uh, uh, create the State Bank of India New Delhi main branch account. And then if you want to use another utilization account, you can open it with any nationalized bank uh, having core banking facilities uh, and is PFMS compliant. And you have to intimate the ministry about it and let them approve that. Once that is approved, uh, there is a form called FC6D for utilization accounts. You can have more multiple utilization accounts. Or if you are already registered in that FCRA and you have an old FCRA account, that can also be treated as an additional FCRA account. But there's a form called FC6C that you have to fill up and you have to get the approval of the ministry in this regard. And yes, you can do that. So having said that, you can even carry out every activity that you want directly from your State Bank of India account using net banking, etc. So, but if you feel you have a need to have a utilization account, Yes, there is a possibility for doing that as well. Okay. And there's a couple of questions about FCRA timelines. So I'll just read out one of them. We had okay. a FCRA six months ago and an inspection by the local officers of IB happened within one month of application, but no further action after that. How long does it take for FCRA to be for approval to be received? And then the now that, that that's a, that's a, that's that's not a legal question. That's a system question. Mm -hmm. And people have been known to wait several months. Some have even waited for a year and more. So, uh, well, under the law, it says that they are supposed to dispose of all applications uh, uh, within a period of 90 days. But that seldom happens. So, uh, but um, yes, yeah, be prepared to wait. You have to track your application, and it probably shows under process. And as long as it shows under process, you can continue to hope that you will get it. And uh, someday if it pops up that you got your registration, you celebrate, or you might receive some bad news that you are being rejected, then try to find out what is the reason for rejection and maybe sort that out. And after the, after a gap of six months, you can reapply again for it. Or there's no appellate tribunal uh, in case you get rejected for some silly reason. Uh, the only remedial action is to go to a court of law and... Uh, which some have done and even managed to get favorable orders. Uh, but that's how it is. Uh, to answer your question, you'll have to wait and can't say how long. People have been known to wait for a year and even more at times. Okay, thank you. Um, and someone else has asked, we had registered our NGO three years ago, but have had transactions only this year from June. We haven't filed previous returns. Can we now apply for 12, uh, 12 A and ATG? Yes, you can apply, but it will be only effective from this year. What has happened in the previous years is gone now. But uh, yes, you can apply for 12A and ATG at any point of time. Uh, so if you will go again to the income taxes new portal and try to fill up form number 10A, uh, there's a strong possibility that you are a first-time applicant. You will get a provisional 12A for a period of three years because you are a first-time applicant and for ATG as well provisionally for three years. And after that, looking at your activities, you will be allowed to apply for a more longer one for a period of five years. So yes, better late than never. Uh, fill up the same form number 10A. 
preferably do it through your chartered accountant because they know the systems well and uh, that would be the best way around for you thank you um do you keep, how do you keep track of various legal compliances like it fcra mha in one window with all sorts of revised dates and new regulations coming up I'm there sure. there, are, there are softwares that you can be using there are uh, private vendors who have developed these kind of softwares to give you alerts on okay you are now up for quarterly intimation uh, there are i mean if you are interested they the package costs a sum of money but if you are an organization that wishes to invest in those kinds of software which can be installed into your computers there there are private vendors that have created such thing uh, rajesh do you know of anything would you like to intervene at this point if you know of anything uh so you have to really get more professional there is no other way and uh, to to improve these are these are the systemic improvement that i was talking about why you need money for right. run, running the operational stuff of the organization the back end so right you have to improve your system you have to get uh, good systems in place which will monitor so that human error uh, you know can be avoided yes. correct correct uh rajesh actually one other question that's come up about uh fundraising is if you can share any practical tips on fundraising including drafting of project proposals so that's a, a long uh, you know it can't, it can't be done in uh, such a mm -hmm. short time fair enough uh, it, i mean uh, it requires probably a short session on uh, you know writing uh, proposal okay generally organizations follow uh, their own templates mm -hmm. and uh, develop their own templates uh, so it will it, it, it will be good i mean in, if you do some secondary research mm -hmm. about proposals to ratan tata trust which has done uh, phenomenal work in the area of grant giving you will find many useful documents do some secondary research read some great proposals and then create your own uh, template that makes a lot of sense so essentially read what other organizations have done and get inspiration from there absolutely it has to be very very organized the other thing is these global grant making organizations they have all become very good with online uh, applications hmm. so even for fun you go to some of their website and uh, try to you know look at the how actually the proposals are submitted there it has become more complex now because you have to bid now there is bidding that is happening globally like the global tb uh, global grants uh, i got for care which was around 20 million dollar in uh, around 8 years back so these are all bidding now these big grants are all you have to bid very well and you have to be very professional you don't have your own template you have to do it in someone else's so a lot of research will help you okay thank you uh, i'm aware of the time so i'm just going to take a two or three last questions before we end the session today uh noshir someone has asked if you can explain a little bit more about point 2 of the compliance slide which is no foreign national other than an indian origin should be a key member of the ngo sure so one of the things that they ask about your board members is citizenship so the moment you write that uh, this is a citizen of uk or the usa that's a red flag but if in addition you say that they happen to also hold an oci card or a pio uh, status then that will be tolerated but uh, it's been made very clear under the fcra rules that foreign nationals cannot be on your board so if you are somebody who is a citizen of the usa uk or any other country for that matter uh, and without any oci status pio uh, it can be a reason for being disqualified uh, to be registered under fcra it's weird i mean but uh, well most things about fcra are weird <laughs> yeah um and can you please take another example to explain the 20% business income not being allowed under object 6 object 6 is as i said there are lots of activities that are not covered under 5 that means you are not working directly for relief of poverty or education or health care and you come under any other I, the most classical example i could give was of my own organization 
which is doing capacity building for the non -risk. So we have 12A, we have ATG, we have FCRA, but we also charge for our services. For example, we may be charging fees for the seminars and webinars. Uh, when companies seek our consultation, we charge consulting fees. Now I have to ensure that all these fee-based income that my organization get, which is considered as business income. First, my objects must permit it. So my objects are saying, yes, my objective is capacity building, and therefore I'm entitled to do that. I must ensure that all this business income, that is my fees, I'm not into sale of products, but if there was sale of products, that is also business income, does not exceed 20% of my non-business income. And I gave you that example earlier. Well, let's say you receive donations, grants of a crore of rupees. At the rate of 20%, up to 20 lakhs, I'm fine. If I make 21 lakhs or 22 lakhs, my total income in that year, including that one crore of donation and grants, becomes liable to tax. So that I, if I have two crores worth of donations and grants, then I can do business up to 40 lakhs at the rate of 2%. So it's as uh, kind of as simply as I can put it. Right. Perfect. Thank you. And just the last question for the mm -hmm. day. Uh, do you advise drafting very broad objects clauses as a precautionary measure to be able to engage in a variety of activities without tax or other yeah. issues? Maybe usually that is the standard thing that I recommend that uh, we put all those things which are there under the Income Tax Act that we will work for relief of poverty, education, uh, monuments, etc. Everything is put over there. And then we put this defining clause that without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing, these will be the specific objects that we will. So there are general and there will be some of the primary and incidental objects that you will have. So yes, there is a method of doing all that and it's something that is recommended. Okay, perfect. Okay, now it's it's uh, one thirty six, so I'm going to start to wrap up. But thank you both so much for giving us your time today uh, and for this really incredibly insightful talk. Um, I know you had to cover a lot of topics, and so we tried to go through it as fast as we could. Um, and and that's probably why we had so many insightful questions at the end. But thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. I'm also going to take this opportunity to just tell all of our participants a little bit about iProbono, so you know when you should get in touch with us. Uh, we provide pro bono legal support to NGOs so that they can focus their resources on their programmatic work instead of on legal costs. If an NGO needs help on any legal issues, things like IP registration, drafting internal policies, vetting contracts, anything like that, please reach out to us on our website. We also engage in litigation representing vulnerable individuals and communities uh, through our panel of pro bono lawyers. You can contact us if you feel there is something that you'd like to discuss with us regarding litigation. I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone uh, who took the time to join us today. I hope you found this session helpful. Uh, please share a brief bio about yourselves or your NGO with us by Friday the 13th. Around 10 to 100 to 150 words would be great. And then we'll help you connect with other participants. And also, please keep an eye out in your email inbox for a recording of this session and a comprehensive guide uh, on the topics that we covered today. Thank you so much. And thank you, Rajesh and Noshir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye.